Play around with it. Wait. Play around with it. Who's heard of, okay, let's back up. Who's heard of React? All right. Uh, who's played around with React? Is anyone using React in production? Okay, great. So you guys won't know that. I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so all right, great. Well, we're going to talk about React. Uh, everyone's heard about it. And basically, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what I see as the real advantages of using React versus a deep dive on the internals of React. There's a lot of presentations and videos and content out there that's like, <coughs> how, what, it, what is React? How does it work? I'm going to do a high level overview, but I just want to talk about what I think the benefits of it are and how we're actually using it. Uh, so I'm Aaron Murray. I, uh, Co-founded a company called Fractal. We do a lot of open source, like Gulp and stuff like that. Uh, Funky Tech on Twitter and all kinds of things where you have a handle. Uh, we are Fractal as well. So I kind of just did this disclaimer, like this is not a talk about React. Um, it's not going to be a super deep technical dive about React. And this is also my disclaimer, like I'm not a complete expert. Like there's probably plenty of stuff in React that I wouldn't know the answer to as far as you know, very specific, very granular details about certain properties of it. Um, but I do use it on a, on a daily basis. So it kind of is. So at a high level, what is React? So React is a front-end JavaScript library for building UIs. It's the V or the view in MVC. It's a virtual DOM and a virtual DOM diff implementation. And it has a really good component system package, and that's part of it. What React is not is an MVC framework. So I think this is a point of confusion for people just kind of starting out with React is thinking it's a, a competitor to Ember or Angular or something like that, and it's really not. It's just, a, it's, just a li it's just a view library for rendering views. So what do I think the high level benefits are of React? Uh, so it is just the UI, it is just the view. So. It's a standalone lib. It doesn't make any assumptions about your stack. People use it in Angular within a directive. You could use it in Backbone to replace a view and use other parts of Backbone. So I think this is one benefit of it. Components. Really good component system. It has well-bounded components. It encapsulates state within the view with either state or props. So. If you have some bit of state in your view, like you just want to toggle something on and off, or you want to maintain some particular piece that's not really part of your, necessarily of your overall model of your application, but rather something that just exists within that view, you would use this dot state, and that's what it's for. Uh, similarly, if you have a component, and so I'm going to make a timer component, or you know a select box component, and I want people to be able to pass things in and have this reusable component, it accepts a props object that you can pass in as well. And so those are the two ways uh, to deal with state. And that's one of those things, and I'm sure before this talk is over, I'm going to go on some kind of rant about functional programming and how much better it is than, uh, than non-functional programming. And, but really, when you say, like, oh, especially in JavaScript, I, I, oh, I'm all about functional programming, what does that mean? Uh, immutability is part of it. But I think the, one of the biggest things about functional programming is that there's always explicit strategies for dealing with state, as opposed to the implicit mutability of kind of pervasive and object-oriented or imperative programming, right? Like, <coughs> in, in, like imperative or object-oriented programming, and someone's going to say, you're totally wrong. I have this great way to manage state. But generally, there is no explicit strategy to deal with state. You just pervasively mutate variables and objects and, and whatnot, with maybe they're bounded within a class and maybe not or whatever, right? And this is why we always say globals are terrible and they're, they're scary because when you have globals and you're pervasively mutating them the way that it's easy to do in JavaScript because it's a hybrid and not a purely functional language, you end up with a lot of problems and you end up with things in states that you didn't expect them to be in because you're modifying them from multiple sources. So the state is very cleanly encapsulated within the component. Oh, all right. That's good. Uh, that works. I, let's see that. Probably see better. Uh, the state's very cleanly encapsulated, and there's a very explicit strategy. If you're passing, if it's a component and you're passing stuff in, it's props. If it's internal to the view, it's it's state. Uh, you basically get interfaces with prop types. So I'll get to that in just a second. 
Uh, and I have some examples here, but I'm going to go into those later. So prop types, oh, you can't see that at all. Sorry about that, but can anybody <laughs> read this at all? Basically, let me tell you what this is. This is a runtime, this is like a schema or a runtime contract, which is part of React, to put on your components. So what it's actually saying is you can have, you, you declare prop types within your component, and you can basically say, hey, this, this variable is expected to be of this type. So it's going to be an array, a bool, a function, it's required, and you can just add dot is required or, or functional. So this is really just a little DSL or whatever you want to call it for defining a schema or an interface to your component. So this is pretty cool. Um, I liken it to if anybody's ever seen code contracts in .NET or this whole like, the contract idea that came out of Eiffel. I don't know who else has really implemented it, but uh, I know .NET had code contracts at some point at least. And uh, it's like a runtime checking, right? So in lieu of, a for of an actual type system or doing any kind of static checking, it's just, a, it's just like a, a real simple way that they provide to make sure that people are using your components correctly, that the right things are going in. So uh, when you're in development mode, this will just, it's, it's nothing fancy. It'll just throw in the console while you're developing and tell you, hey, you didn't get the right, the right uh, properties to this component. Um, and it's disabled in, in production so that there's not a performance hit on doing this checking. So uh, one of the architecture, I guess, tenants that I always strive for is high cohesion, loose coupling. Right? So you want like things to be together, located together. That's your cohesion. And then we, we all know loosely coupled. Like you don't want just this big, I mean, it's the difference. I mean, that's why we're using any kind of MVC in front end JavaScript. For years and years, people just kind of stuck everything in, a fi in one file, right? You had like a thousand line file with all your great jQuery and then you included it in a script tag and you were done, right? So that's highly cohesive, but it's not loosely coupled. You couldn't tease that apart. You couldn't test it. You couldn't reuse those components and things like that. So that's loose coupling. Um, but I also think high cohesion is really important because you don't want things just sprayed across. I mean, now with like required JS and you know, more recently Browserify, people are breaking things into modules, so they're getting loose coupling. But are they cohesive, or are things just completely sprayed across, across your project? What do you mean by high cohesion? So just that like, thi like, like things, and I'm going to show an example in just a second, but that like things are, co -lo are located in, in, a, in a close, in, a, in the same space. So I'll get there. I'll, I'll show you in a second. So right here. OK, so this is loose coupling. So let's say I made some components in React. I, uh, again, I apologize for the small size, but video, right, a video chat component, I have a select component and a timer component. So I break these into different components. They're their own modules. I could include them in with require.js or browserify. You can't see, I, I drew a line around it and I said these have a thick bounded context, which is an idea that I really take from domain driven design. If anybody was in J2EE era, that was a popular idea then, where you talked about bounded context and having these kind of contract, contracts or interfaces around components and modules so they could talk to each other, but you couldn't just randomly reach into one from another with no kind of verification in your program. So I think, so first of all, mod, just modules in JavaScript in general, right, on the front end get you some kind of loose coupling. Uh, and then I'll come right back to cohesion in just a minute. So this is the, this is the other uh, really big part of React that I think is really one of the hardest parts for people to deal with. Has everyone seen the JS, have you, has everyone seen a React example? And I could pull one up with the JSX, the XML inlined in the code, or, or code, preferably, right? But uh, the, the, the idea that your layout is in the code, um, I can show an example. Has everybody seen this? OK, cool. I'll show an example. Um, so let me see if I can just do this really easily. Failing me a little bit. That's literally the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. What? Are you on TP attendees? 
I am on TP speakers, but okay, uh, I'm just better. Um, yeah. When I came in here from the other room, I had to like toggle my Wi-Fi on. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Let me. All right, give me one second here. I apologize. You just can we both stand up? Okay, I'll just pretend and I'll come back to that. How about that? Okay, we fail. So, right. Let me see if I can just click this. All right, there we go. Something better. Gonna pretend that we've seen that. I'll come back to it as soon as the Wi-Fi uh, starts working for me. So layout and code. So basically, the idea is there's not a separate template. Like if you've done Backbone or whatever, you pick like mustache templates and you say, "Hey, I'm I'm going to use this template in conjunction with this view, and we're going to put these things together." Uh, React doesn't do that. The layout is actually embedded into the the rendering function. So. You can use either uh, JSX, which is an XML-like dialect, or you could use pure code to do this. And I will have an example up in a minute. So obviously, this is the initial reaction. Everyone freaks out. That's the initial reaction, like templating in my code, because we've been told for our entire careers that you have to separate presentation and logic. I've been told that for 20 years. Um, really, the question that I start to ask is why? Why is it so critical? And I think the traditional answer was, Oh, because the designers, they don't know anything about programming and you got to separate the templates out so the designers on your team or, you know, the, the kind of an older paradigm. We didn't really talk about UX, I don't feel like 10 years ago, like no one was talking about UX engineers. You just had designers and, of course, they couldn't do code and, you know, you needed to, to separate this stuff out. And I just don't think that's true anymore because now you have UX engineers and everybody writes code who's doing any kind of complex layout. I feel like it's not, you don't have pure HTML. It's not like you got your PHP people over here and then someone's over here writing, you know, HTML templates. It's really a lot, a lot more together. So that's how I think you get to loose coupling high cohesion. So to answer your question, the idea is, okay, so on the right, this is kind of a traditional templating solution. Uh, have you used Backbone or something like that? We use like Express and all the libraries that come with it. Okay, so server side rendering versus more client side MVC. Um, and this is up with Angular. So Angular? Oh, you do use Angular. Okay. So I'm not going to like talk about Angular too much. I think Angular has a really good use case as far as scaling to big teams and things like that. Um, uh, a better comparison to what I'm trying to talk about here is Backbone, where I think that. You really it's the MVC organizational layout altogether that I think breaks cohesion to some extent, which is you're spread like you're basically organizing by uh, by types of files versus content, right? So you've got your JS folder or your views folder that's like your backbone views. So you've got like your your video chat component or your select component, and then you've got your templates folder. And we see this on clients on server side MVC too. It's like you separate out by model view controller. Um, so really, you're organizing by what type of file it is versus what content. And so when you basically you're separating, I find this really cumbersome when I try to go back to an old like backbone and marionette project that I'd have. And it's like, my templates are in the templates. I gotta dig like into the templates folder to open up like the video chat component template. And then I gotta go open up the view. And these things are separated by the type. So that's, they're loosely, these things are loosely coupled because they're broken apart, but they're not cohesive. So that's what I mean by high cohesion. Whereas React, because your templating is actually right in your view, and we'll get to, we'll get to an example of that in a minute that's not gonna require me to pull up the internet. So. Uh, it, 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 I, it's my contention that it gives you more, more cohesion because now you have one video chat component that has your logic for that view, the state maintained within that view, and the actual template right within it to render that. And so the question I think immediately is, doesn't that get long? Isn't that that's the concern? But I think what it does too is it, from, it forces you to break things into smaller components and subcomponents. Uh, so if I have a video chat component, I don't just make a big monolithic video chat component. It's a video chat component that has a timer component within it. And 
you know, the actual video tag component within it and whatever else is going to be on my video call, right? The buttons, the, the hang up buttons or whatever. So it kind of forces and, and you have all the functionality of each of those small pieces within that, within that component versus, so, so basically that's loose coupling high cohesion is now my, my timer component that counts down how much time is left in my video call, that logic isn't sprayed across you know, isn't part of this bigger thing. It's it's actually within a timer component, which is within you know a subcomponent, and then it's reusable. But I don't, I don't tout code reuse too much because I think it's a myth, basically. But um, to some extent, um, what I mean is when you're making custom components for a particular application, uh, I think that trying to make them reusable is premature optimization. It's it, like, I think you should make stuff and if you go to another project and you're like, hey, that would be great, go, go break that out and make it really clean, but don't do that as you go. I think it's a form of premature optimization. But that's just my opinion. So, um, DOM diffing, what are we talking about with the DOM diff? So, virtual DOM, we've probably heard that around React, virtual DOM, DOM diffing algorithm, stuff like that. So, basically, React creates a virtual DOM, it batches DOM read and write operations, and does an efficient update of the subtree only. So what does that really mean? It, it dirty, che it dirty checks um, what changed in your component. So just to back up for a second, again, for anyone who hasn't used React, uh, the, the way that state works um, is when you set state uh, on your view, it actually causes, or appears to cause, a full re-render of your view to take place. So think about that for a second. That's so. Whenever you change state within the view, it appears to cause it appears to call your render function again. So think of any MVC framework you've ever used that has a render function, right? And that's going to get triggered automatically whenever you set some bit of state. Now this is really significant because what that means is as opposed to trying to do two-way binding, where you're loading up this view and you're like binding some, some model within, or state within your view to a button, or whatever, checkbox, uh, there is no two-way binding. And there is no engineering, uh, like I found I end up doing in Marionette and Backbone, basically implementing your own little render engine to try to like track and re-render pieces that need to get re-rendered. Re because those are really the two options. You either like track your state and re-render something every time it changes yourself, or you do some kind of two-way binding that tries to keep your mo the model or the state out of your view and some component on your, in, your, in your view that's been rendered in sync, right? Does that, does that kind of make sense? So React does that for you. And, and so basically, the, the last tenet is this idea of one-way data flow. This is what React really touts. And to me, this is, it kind of, besides the component system, which is great, like it all comes down to this of why React is really useful, is what does it really mean when they say one-way data flow? Plain and simply, it means you set the state and forget. You set the state, and it appears that a full re-render of your, of your view took place. Now, that didn't happen, because that's what we're talking about on the last slide with the virtual DOM is it actually intelligently figures out for you, it does a diff of just what changed, just what updated, and it updates that for you in the DOM tree. So, so if, I, if I click check, you know, it, the checkbox, or if I change something in my state within the view, it's, it's as if I had completely re-rendered, done a complete page reload. So I'm not thinking about binding two ways, I'm not thinking about managing that at all myself. It's just fire. You fire that state change, and your and your view automatically updates, and it does it, it does so really performantly. So basically, what it does is it gives you a higher level of, of abstraction than two-way binding because you're not thinking about it anymore. You just you just fire and forget your state change, and it's going to appear to you as the developer that a complete refresh has taken place. Has anybody ever who's done clients that MVC have you ever found gone into some particularly sticky logic? And then you're ju you just fire a full page reload because it's like easier to do. I'm seeing some nodding. Okay, it's not just me. Because you're like, you're in some backbone thing and you're like, this is so messed up. I can't keep track of this state. I'm just going to fire a full refresh and then like render it from, from the database or whatever. And it's going to be correct after they save this thing. So I've done that. And so like basically you get to do that all the time with React with no, with no performance hit. 
with no page reload. It just does it for you. So you get this, you get the, it's basically let this le uh, lessens your cognitive load. It's easier to think about, it's easier to reason about what's gonna happen because it's as if you got a fresh page reload or a full, you know, a full first time page load every time. So your templating becomes really, really simple because you're just expressing what you think is. It's as if you had just fired up the page, you pulled from the data, some data from a database and rendered it. So we all know how to think about that. That's really, really easy to think about. And so now you get to do that pretty much all the time. So that's, that's, re that's really my, my arguments for React is, so it's flexible, it's unopinionated, it's got a good component system, you can get bounded context, you can achieve high cohesion loose coupling of your components, and you get this one-way data flow, which is like the biggest, the biggest thing you get out of this. Um, and in fact, as far as I know, like even Angular, the next version of Angular is going to implement something more like uh, this DOM diffing algorithm uh, that React is doing uh, versus their current, um, what do you call it, digest loop. Yes? How technical are the, like, the one-way data flow and the virtual DOM? Like, when I think of the, those two things, they're like separate, right? I, I would say that the, that the virtual DOM enables the one-way data flow because it's basically that virtual DOM Right, it's holding this virtual state, and then it, when you trigger that re-render, it diffs against the new state that you're going to be in, and it just applies that diff to the to the DOM tree. So, so I wouldn't say they're tightly coupled. I would say that it enables the, that the virtual DOM, like, because that's what you hear about with React. It's like, oh, it's got a virtual DOM, and it does this virtual DOM diff. But what it's really enabling is this one way, this idea of one way data flow that you that you fire and it, and it triggers the render. And the one-way data flow, is that only like from the model to the view, or can it be like from the view to the model? Like it that input box or something like that? Right, no, it's, it's, so it's when you change something in the view, it, you're, you're setting the state on, on the view, and it's basically getting, but see that's the thing, right? So you're, uh, so if you're typing into a check, say you're typing into an input box, and you've got an on change event, right? That's updating some state within your view, but that's already there. It's like you already typed it. So the, the, DOM, the virtual DOM is going, oh, nothing. There's no diff. There's no difference between what's currently rendered, because you just typed that out, and what's, and what's there, right? So it's intelligently, it's not going like, to hit you with a performance hit of like trying to re-render stuff. Does that kind of make sense? So yeah, it's, 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 two way, it's, like, it's one way in that cognitively to you as a developer, it always appears that a render is being called whenever you change data. But yeah, you absolutely, you're setting, you're setting state whenever you change anything in the view and you set that state on your view, it will trigger a render. So if, if there's, if you type into a check, okay, so I'll show an example in a minute, I'll get the website up here, is, it, but if you type, you're typing into an input box and you have some, uh, a div that's just the content of which is tied to the state of that input box, right? Like a traditional, just like a really simple hello world where you're like typing in and it's like saying hi your name. So yeah, exactly. So as you type, it's going to trigger, uh, apparently it's going to trigger a re-render every time that on that on change event fires, right? Because as you type on change, you're setting the state on the view. So the view is apparently triggering a re-render even though it's not really doing that. It's, it's the virtual DOM is diffing it, saying, okay, what's different? Oh, they added, they added one character, right? So I type hi A, and it's, okay, re-render A. A, okay, what's new? They added, you know, there's, it's an A. So it's just gonna, it's just gonna splice that second, that each letter you type into the DOM. So that's, that's kind of how that DOM diff works. Yeah. So, okay, let's build an application now. Uh, you guys are all sold on React, right? It's amazing. So, let's, let's build an app. Oh, it, but wait, we, we can't really because it's not an MVC framework. So how are we gonna build an app around this? So, I think the options are, so now, we, so now I, I think this is the reason why no one raised their hands who's using React in production because it's just a view library. So the question becomes, how do you build around? How do you build around it? Because uh, not a lot of people who work real jobs can say, "Hey, tell their boss like, hey, we're just going to stop for a couple months here and build a new MVC." Yet another MVC framework around React, or uh, so we can use this in production. 
So the first, uh, has anybody heard of Flux? <coughs> flux a little bit? So I think the first option is Flux, which is something that Facebook uses. Um, so I should have mentioned React came out of Facebook. Uh, it really, it, it happened as a reaction to them trying to manage their complexity in their application, which is significant. Uh, so Flux is this idea that came out of Facebook as well. It's what they're using. It's an architecture, it's not a framework. It eschews the MVC paradigm in favor of a different paradigm that they created here. Uh, I, I like it in theory, it's a little more functional. But um, basically, this is the idea right here, is instead of MVC, instead of model view controller, you have a view which emits actions, which goes to a dispatcher, which is like a central event bus or a cent, right, like a, a central dispatching, global dispatching channel, which then notifies a store. So instead of your, this is really where your quote unquote model lives. And views have listeners wired up to stores. So, okay, to do example, I have a to do view, it dispatches an add to do action. So I type into an input box, it dispatches an add to do. That goes to the dispatcher, which tells the to do store, hey, you need to add a to do, which is your abstraction to your database or local storage or whatever. Your view in turn has a listener to that to do store. So it notifies your view, which triggers a re-render. So now your now, now your to-do is now displayed in your view. Kind of roundabout, but you could see uh, Facebook, their their use case, their application is so complex, and they really wanted to like get away from having explicit like a lot of like uh, actual controllers and things like that. Like they just they do you can do things from all over the site, so they wanted to do that right. They wanted to be able to kind of fire off, oh, I want this event to happen, and then who knows what views might be listening to that store. So you could fire an event in one place uh, from one view, and 10 views could be listening to the result of what happens with that, um, with, with that what happens once that to-do is actually added to the database and triggers this, this re-render. 10 things could be listening to re-render. So Fluxor is an actual concrete implementation. It's a library that someone Created. It's a framework someone created based around this. So what's wrong with Flux? Uh, I, I, I think in, in theory it's good. Um, if you go and look at the like to do MVC Flux example, my personal opinion is it gets really, really verbose. And uh, like many things, it's like if you're trying to do something simple, it's kind of overkill, at least with the way that they have designed it. But again, it was designed to run Facebook, the Facebook app, right? So they have a lot of reasons for making, for I think creating the thing, the, the things the way they did, but um, the thing that's confusing to me is uh, just uh, to troll on Angular people a little bit. Like that, when you come into Angular and you're a non-Angular person, you're just like, "What the hell is dollar sign scope? What is a directive?" Like, there's all these new words you have to learn, and you're just kind of like, it kind of gives you a little bit of a code smell where you're like, "I." The API surface on this is too big. I don't have time to learn this. Like I, because once you throw a, a term at me that I don't even know what it is, like a directive or whatever else that you know is an Angular, I'm just like I, I can't. I don't have like the time to to understand what your newfangled uh, uh, artifacts are in your system, right? So, and everyone's thinking who does Angular? Oh, it's really easy. You just do this and this and this and this. But you know, I I I'm just saying. So, same thing with this, like. <laughs> They're like, no, we don't do MVC at all. Like, it's not MVC, it's, it's Flux. But, I mean, store, that kind of sounds like model or collection. I mean, it's a storage place. Uh, actions and dispatch are kind of form a controller. So basically, it's my contention that no matter what you do, you cannot escape MVC. Like, you just can't do it. It's, it's everything's basically, there's no architecture you can come up with that's not basically MVC at the end of the day. So, um, so interfission. Uh, so I'm not here to pump my project, but this is a concrete implementation of, that we're using in production uh, that we've built around React. So what is it? It's basically React for views, uh, ampersand model and collections, and page.js for routing, and that with, a couple, with a few bits of sugar on top, and that's pretty much it. And so what we've tried to do is we've just put together 
some opinions and some conventions around on top of React so we can say, hey, so I can actually give this to a junior engineer and say build something with this, right? And we're not sitting around uh, trying to architect a new paradigm around React because that's just, it's just not really productive. So has anybody uh, messed around with ampersand? Uh, so ampersand is something that came out of and yet, which is like a node in JavaScript shop. And basically what it is, is it's a port, it's a modular port of Backbone. So they broke all the Backbone pieces into modular common JS modules, basically so that you could use them sanely with Browserify. Because frankly, Backbone comes from a, er a previous, an era that's really before module systems on the front end. Like if you ever try to use uh, backbone plugins or break any piece of, if you've ever tried to break a piece of backbone apart, like, oh, I just want to use the models, or I just want to use this. It's really, really difficult because, and also the other problem is backbone models, um, or I'm sorry, backbone plugins are generally dependent on having a global backbone, variable called backbone that it can monkey patch. So this is very, very bad if you're doing Browserify, right? Like the last, or you know, using a front end module system, the last thing you want to do is have like a global backbone instance and like monkey patch uh, override functions on it, right? So, uh, so ampersand is just basically a port of, of backbone broken into really small pieces. So we're just using the models and collections out of that. So what does that end up looking like? So basically, back to this diagram, though, it's, uh, I think this is kind of interesting. We're using React for our view. But I like what they're doing fundamentally here with having the actions and the dispatcher in the store. But if, if anybody's ever really used Backbone collections, any back, Backbone users here? There's a couple. Or, is everybody else doing Angular? <laughs> oh, Ember? OK, no Ember. That's good. Oh. So uh, basically, though, what, what happens is when you have uh, backbone collections, or in my case, ampersand collections, mm -hmm. is it provides a global cache of collections. Um, and so just let me explain really quickly. So if I have a collection, uh, if I modify a model that's within that collection, it notifies its parent collection. Um, that parent collection has a global cache. Is it, so basically, in short, is it forms a poor man's uh, event bus, like kind of what's going on with this dispatcher, right? So if I have a view and I, and I have a model within it that's part of a collection and I modify the state of that model within my view, it notifies its, parents, its parent collection with some, which emits an event that I can listen to anywhere. So what does that sound like? I mean, it, it gives you pretty much for free this same kind of flow. Now I think uh, the guys from Facebook would say, in fact, they've probably said this to me. That's too implicit. That's too much magic. That's why we like this. It's very explicit. And again, for their use case, I think that's actually a totally valid criticism. Um, for me, what I was going for was I wanted something that felt very much like Backbone, that felt like a fairly traditional MVC that's easy for people to understand, that's easy for junior developers to get on board with and understand really quickly, oh, OK, I got a model and a collection, and I can, I can modify this stuff. And, um, the right things are going to get notified. So uh, basically, the collections here form a de, uh, a de facto action and dispatcher kind of queue. And uh, yeah, so you're not going to be able to read this at all, are you? Can, can you dim the lights back there, actually? You know, let's see if that helps. It's a very confusing light, so I'll try my best. Does that help at all? That's still just way too small. It's, it's better, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just way too small. Oh, perfect. OK, cool. So, so this is a model. So this is just a direct pass through of ampersand model. So, so now I'm actually finally getting into part of my talk where I'm like, OK, so how do I actually build an app with this? Um, so here's a model. Looks pretty straightforward, right? I'm defining, I've got a fetch URL set up because it, this is going to uh, hit a rest endpoint when you modify it. Um, so ampersand models, one distinction between ampersand and backbone models is ampersand models actually do require a schema. So I have to put you know, what, my, what my properties are and what type they have. But that's good because it just gives you runtime, some kind of runtime uh, type checking for free. 
So here's what my router looks like. So I'm just setting up, okay, uh, again, React does not provide anything. It does not provide any, it does not provide a router, it does not provide, does not have a concept of models, right? So that's, that's coming back to, you know, it's just, it just handles the view layer. So it's, it's great if you sit that in Angular or Backbone, but if you're just trying to use it on its own, you can't really do it. So this is just a wrapper around page.js that you just tell it what elements you want to load into and you give it your view, okay? Set it up to a route, nothing, nothing crazy here. What you'd expect in routing. So here's a collection view. So now does Angular have an idea, have the concept of like a collection view, model view? No? Okay. So whenever I've used Backbone, I've always used Marionette with it. Uh, Marionette's like a additional, you know, a third party library to use with, with Backbone. I find the API surface to be uh, insanely large and hard to grok, but um, the one thing that I really always liked out of it was a collection view. Which is to say, if I create, you know, what's hap basically what's happening here, which is if I, if I create a collection view, which is a special type of view, and I give it a model, and I give it an item view, it's going to automatically render, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, and then I set up a template. It's going to automatically take my collection, iterate over it, and render each model out of that collection into whatever item view I get it. Does that make sense? So I find the, I, the collection view, item view, I find this important because it's like 70, per, it's basically, it's the, same, it's the same resolution as CRUD. Like it's a 70% use case, right? Like 70% of, of business applications that you write consist of writing CRUD. Like a REST API and something like this where it's like, oh, I'm just trying to, iter you know, I have a collection, I'm trying to iterate over it and render the items out and then you can interact with those items which then modify the collection. Like, I find that to be a 70% use case when I'm writing business type applications. So, so just to walk through what's happening here, I've got a collection view, I'm giving it a model called to do. I'm giving it an item view, which is defined on the next slide. And then to answer your earlier question, so I'm not using JSX, I'm using pure code. But if you look at my render function here, you just define, I'm defining purely, uh, my, my template is all code. So that's, you know, h1 input div. These are simply functions in React's DOM. So is this similar to what uh, JSX would render out? Yes. Is it exactly Or can you write it a little bit differently? Because I think when I looked at it, there were like some extra arguments like, for like the render function, I guess. Some extra arguments for the render function. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. We can look at it later. I mean, JSX is going to render roughly to something like this. I, I don't like JSX because I don't like the idea of HTML like XML in my JavaScript. I just I think the argument is simply that people think it's closer to HTML, so they like that. Uh, kind of like the Angular argument, right? The HTML is the best templating language, and everyone already knows HTML. So I think that's why they did JSX. Uh, but personally, I think the code is a lot better. But what's really cool to me is the idea that this is just arbitrary JavaScript code. It's just a function. When I call the div, it's just a function that's going to produce a div. Um, but what's really cool about that is because I'm in arbitrary code land, I can just I can map over that. I could filter over it. I could reduce over it, right? I could take I could take something, map over it, and emit and produce in render divs out of that out of that reduce. Like that's really, really powerful to me. So that's that's what I really like. And and I say this all the time, like once you go to arbitrary code, I, I would never go back to templating. Because uh, you know with templating I think you do so much hacking in your view where you're like, hey, I'm like prepping this date and I'm prepping this and I'm prepping that. You're like doing all this extra work and then you're like passing that just to get it down into your template, which generally doesn't have any kind of logic. So I have found, again, it breaks everything we've been told for the last 15 or 20 years, which is like, oh, you gotta separate your presentation from your logic, and it's gotta be 100% clean, it can't have, your templates can't have any logic in them. And uh, I, I, yeah, I think this is really flying in the face of that, and I've, I've found it super empowering uh, to, because I don't care about 
stuff like that. I just care about getting stuff. I just care about getting things done. And so, for me, and and now of course, if there's a trade off of it getting really really messy and unmaintainable, then that's bad. But I have not found that at all. Because you can break this as, into as, small, as many small components as you want, so it can, you're not really at risk of it running amok. Uh, and again, this is what I'm talking about with high cohesion. Uh, we'll get to a more complete example in a second. So this is the model view here. So that's just the, or, um, you know, the, in, the, the item view that's going to get rendered for each item in that collection. Uh, so jumping out of that for a second. I was going to show testing. Uh, I'm going to come back to this since I was having internet problems. So gotchas, a uh, couple of quick gotchas to look out for. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm that guy. <laughs> so on iOS, uh, there is literally an, a bug when with on click, if you don't explicitly set the style of something to cursor pointer, the click won't register on iOS. So I spent some time tracking this down. Do not take this as a sign of the maturity of React. It's 99% it's really good, but this was just really, really egregious. I came across this the other day. Uh, I built something out, I sent it to a client, and he said, I, I can't click on anything on iPhone 6. And so I went and found out. <laughs> so as soon as I had the style cursor pointer, it all worked. So that, that was a fun, that was a fun gotcha. Um, another gotcha is that um, uh, there's, there's certain things like, uh, for example, autocomplete right here. There's certain things, uh, because it's a virtual DOM, they don't want to like override things. Certain things are camel cased. Generally things with dashes or certain properties. So like uh, in this input right here, so autocomplete off, that's what that'll do is disable the default in Chrome at least uh, pop-up, you know, when you start typing in the system pop-up of your autocomplete. So sometimes I, I had a case the other day where I wanted to disable that. So I typed this, which is what you would, if it was pure HTML, that would totally work. But for what, uh, whatever reason, React expects autocomplete to be camel cased. So, that sounds terrible, but they're actually really good about throwing warnings on weird stuff that they do. So like if you look at the console, it says right here, when you're sitting there going, hey, why isn't this working? It will, just keep an eye on your console sometimes. It will throw you a warning that's like, it explicitly says, hey, you said auto complete. Did you mean auto camel case C complete, right? And then you just change it and it works. So there's a few things like that that are a little bit, uh, a little bit wonky, but you know. Okay, cool. So. And then I was going to show like a full example. I've got a few minutes left here. Um, so let me just see if I can. Learn that real quick. So I just want to show what this really looks like in practice. And again, uh, why do I like CoffeeScript? Well, with React, I mean, this ends up, this comes out looking like Jade templating. Like it's just, that's part of the reason I like using CoffeeScript with React is the, this, if I'm writing code, it comes out really, really clean. Um, 
So let's just take a look at this real quick. So here's my collection view, right? This is just a, so by the way, this is the entire to-do MVC app in Fission, right here. So sans, sans the model definition, which is in a separate file. So this is, this is the item view, the collection views is the entirety of it. So I think that's pretty terse. And I attribute a lot of that to React, a little bit of it to CoffeeScript. Um, but basically, here's what we got going, right? So here's our collection view. I'm giving it a model, which is a to-do, which is just the same definition we saw before. Here's an item view. Um, and let's jump down to the render. So here's what I was talking about that's really, really beautiful <clears throat> with having arbitrary code, right? Is I can just do something like, oh, here's my collection dot filter to do, to do that. So to filter out, right, you know, like in to do NBC, you want to figure out what's done. I mean, that's, that's gorgeous to me. I just did a filter on that right there. It's right in my render function. It's, it's part of the view logic, right? Like, so I'm not doing that over in some other file and then trying to pass that down to my template or whatever. I think that's really, really nice. So I've got a div here. Um, so, so basically the code in React, it takes as a first property an object where you define things like class name. Now you may be asking yourself, why does that say class name, camel case, instead of class? That's really ugly. Basically they just have the opinion that they don't want to override anything. <clears throat> so they don't like, they didn't want to use class because they think that's just like, that gets wonky with, you're just going to start over, you know, basically not over, overriding browser stuff. <clears throat> So here's an H1, to-dos. Here's my input. I've got a class name on key down, right? Which is like every time you type into the input box, it's going to call this add to-do function. Um, or I'm sorry, the, it, on enter, right? So it's going to check. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, text, just what you'd expect on a basic input box. And then, so this dot items. So I'm sorry, for anyone who doesn't do coffee, that symbol just means this. So this dot <coughs> is this is a fission thing. This is, and all I'm doing here is items is an, an array or a collection of each, each of, it's, the, it's each member of the collection rendered into the item view, okay? So it's, it's, that's what the collection view does, is it gives you something called this.items that basically is your collection, each, each member of which is rendered into the, the item view that you gave it. So, you can see, again, I'm just mapping over it and, and, uh, and emitting it and returning. But I could do something much more complex within that map if I wanted to wrap it in some kind of style or give it you know, a header or whatever. Uh, that's it. And then down here is my length.done. So just jumping to the add to do, right? The event dot which is 13, you probably recognize that. That's just checking if the key that got hit is the enter key. So as they're typing into that input box, if they hit enter, it's going to take, uh, it's going to create a new item in the collection and set the, set the value of the input box back to blank. Again, simple to do example. You type into the box, you hit enter. Okay. So coming up here to the item view, which is rendering. So basically, it's exactly what you'd expect as well. You've got a checkbox, right? We've all seen to do MVC. It's just, right? It's just you type it in. And uh, in fact, right. So this this is to do MVC. If no one's seen it, or, or Tom, if no one's like, you can wrap up. All right, you can wrap up. Right. So this is so the code you just saw, and it's entire like that's it in its entirety creates this, which is the basic to do MVC app. So this has local storage, so it's gonna right like. As I refresh, talk. I should probably do that, right? And it's like as I refresh. So this this has a local storage adapter. I would say that's one more thing that we baked into Fission that uh, uh, I feel like uh, ampersand and backbone kind of punt on, which is having like a really good modular uh, storage solution. So we have a REST plugin, we have a local storage plugin, whatever. But it just kind of like is not cumbersome. You just configure it at the top level of your application. So this is, this is what's produced. So just back to this real quick. Um, so as you expect, right, you've got your checkbox and on click it's going to toggle, which basically just toggles done on that model. Um, so let me explain real quick, sorry. It, the mo this dot model is another fission thing. So basically it just binds when you declare a model view. It just makes the assumption that you're binding a model into this because that's getting provided by the collection view. Um, so checkbox, it's just going to toggle, right? It's just going to toggle if it's done or not, uh, and remove 
is just going to call this, which just calls model.destroy. Again, that's just an ampersand model. It's nothing, nothing special. So that's pretty much it. I mean, it, so this is the entirety of that to do MVC example, right, that you see here. Uh, you put a rest back on, back in on, you put whatever kind of back in you want. So, anyways, to me, this is like a 70% case is you're trying to CRUD stuff, you're trying to store it in some kind of a different store, whether that's a, you're trying to hit a REST API or local storage or Firebase or whatever, that should be completely trans you know, completely interchangeable with basically no further effort. And yeah, that's it. So I mean, and as far as this, this is how you get your high cohesion, right? So you can build these smaller components that just have all the logic, all the layout, everything about them contained right within these, these small components. And you can break them down into subcomponents. Uh, the one last point I want to make is that there is no special like, oh, I got to re, I got to load this subcomponent within my component. You just include, you could just require it in and include it in there. There's nothing special to do. It just, it just falls right through. So, anyways, that's it. Really, thanks.